Good evening. This is your host, Stan Zapansky, for the program True Murder, the most shocking killers in true crime history and the authors that have written about them. To the people of Olney, Texas, 39-year-old Farian Wardrip was an upright citizen, a happily married man, a valued employee, and a respected Sunday school teacher. In January 1999, investigators reviewing the files of three unsolved murders dating back 15 years came across information linking Wardrop to the female victims. Terry Sims, who was bound, raped, and stabbed to death. Tony Gibbs, slashed and sexually assaulted and left in a bus shelter. And Ellen Blau, who disappeared after a work shift and her decomposing, decomposing body found a month later. Clever police snared a DNA sample from Wardrop which matched the DNA found with Terry Sims. Wardrop then confessed to the three murders and one more, Deborah Taylor. Wardrop is also a suspect in ten other murders, but it was Sims' murder that made him eligible for the death penalty. Before the BTK killer, another deadly predator, body hunter. My special guest this evening is, is journalist and author Patricia Springer. Welcome to the program and thank you for agreeing to this interview, Patricia Springer. Thank you, Dan. Good to be with you. Thank you. Now, given the gruesome murder, murders involved in this case, what made you to decide to write Body Hunter, your book about these murders, and the serial killer, Ferry and Wardrip? Well, serial killers are always of interest to readers, and Farron Waldrop's story was fascinating because he had confessed to one murder in the 1980s. He spent time in prison, uh, then apprehended and convicted of three additional murders. Right. Uh, but what put you in a position to be able to have to do this story? What was unique about your situation? Are you from this area? Are you familiar with this? What what brought you to this story? I'm curious. Um, well, it was in the North Texas area, and I live in the North Texas area. Okay. And uh, serial killers are we have had several in this this part of the country, and his story was just rather fascinating because he had served time before. I see. Uh, now, this, the, the story is primarily set in a place called Wichita Falls, Texas. Uh, what is Wichita like? Where does, is its situation in the state, and how far away is it from Fort Worth, Texas? Wichita Falls is located in the northern part of Texas in Wichita County, and Wichita County borders on the Oklahoma line. Okay. Um, it's a city of approximately 100,000 people. Uh, it's home to Midwestern State University, Shepherd Air Force Base, and Wichita Falls State Mental Hospital. A lot of oil business is in that area of the country, right. and it's approximately 120 miles from Fort Worth. Okay, now the killer subject of Body Hunter, as like we mentioned, is Ferry and Wardrip. What was his childhood like based on your research? He was the fourth of nine children born to Diana and George Wardrip of Marion, Indiana. Um, his father was a factory worker and his mother was a homemaker. Um, they grew up fairly poor. Uh, as a child, he often felt lonely and depressed, and he cried easily. When he complained to his parents about that, they just always said that it was a phase and he would grow out of it. But he really never grew out of his discontent. Um, he was embarrassed by his hand-me-down clothes, and he never felt he was on par uh, with his more fluent classmates. Um, although Farron had some success in sports, he played basketball and he was on the swimming team he was a failure academically um, he spent most of his school years in special education classes um, then at 13 he began committing petty crimes like shoplifting and then at 14 he began drinking alcohol and smoking pot uh, that eventually led him to harder drugs like what kind of drugs are we talking uh, speed mostly um, methamphetamine those types of things right Right. Uh, I found it interesting, too, you know, I've read a lot of, about a lot of killers, but uh, this story, that the information that you were able to gather, when he was 17, there was, a, I thought, a very significant event that you really effectively capture in your book. What happened with his family when he was 17? Well, at 17, his father had bought him a used car, just a couple hundred dollars, and he had loaned it to a friend, and that friend had blown the engine in it. 
uh, when his father learned of that, he was furious at Farron, and uh, he continued uh, his irresponsibility in his father's eyes, and, and he demanded that he move out of the family home. Well, Farron really didn't believe they meant it, but he went upstairs and packed his things in a sack and started to leave. And then when his mother called him back, he thought, oh, great, they're just joking, they're just trying to scare me. But when he returned to the house, his mother asked him for the keys, and he knew then that he was pretty much on his own, and he was without his family support any longer. Yeah, it's a pretty uh, traumatic experience for anybody. It's a pretty interesting uh, piece of information as well. Now, what did the Farian do in reaction to this huge change in his life? Well, he dropped out of high school, and he spent most of his time scoring drugs, um, just going from odd job to odd job. He never really landed in anything substantial. Uh, not too long after, at least uh, when he's a young man, he joins the Army. What was that experience like? That uh, How much of a help was the Army and that type of discipline for him? Well, really none. Um, he was seeking direction in his life, and so he thought that if he joined the Indiana National Guard, uh, that that would help give him some substance. But what happened is he went off to boot camp, and he decided he didn't like the discipline and the structure. Uh, he didn't like the regiment of, of the Army. So when he was out of boot camp, um, he decided he was going to take any more orders, and so he just never showed up. Uh, for any of the monthly uh, duties that he had. Uh, instead, he would just smoke marijuana and do drugs, and finally the guard dis dismissed him uh, with a less than honorable discharge. All right. Now he continues, uh, again, somewhat normal life. He he gets married. He gets married to a woman named Jonna, uh, Jonna Jackson, and... Tell us a little bit about this marriage. Was it a good and healthy marriage? Did they have children? Um, it wasn't a very healthy marriage. What had happened is that his father had moved the family to Wichita Falls from Indiana, and Farron just followed along, even though he really wasn't a part of the family. Um, he still wanted to stay in contact with them. He met Jonna Jackson in a bar, and he found her to be fun-loving and spirited. Um, they were married very shortly after they met, um, but it was really rocky from the start. He complained that she wanted not she didn't want to do anything but sit on the sofa and watch TV. She didn't want to work, that she just wanted to stay home and be a wife and mother. Um, they fought over his inability to keep a job and his failure to provide for them. Um, and during her first pregnancy, uh, Farron had 10 different jobs, so he was not very good at holding and maintaining a job. Um, his childhood feelings of inadequacy returned, and he continued to abuse drugs and alcohol. Uh, after three years of marriage and the birth of two children, uh, John finally filed for divorce. And uh, how did he accept that that in, uh, that decision of, of Jonna's as well? How did he react to that as well? Oh, he was furious. Um, decided that he hated Jonna. Uh, he he was very angry and just went further into his alcohol and drugs as a way to cope with the situation that he couldn't do anything right. And what year was the divorce uh, and uh, finally or finalized? Oh, I'm not real sure. It was in the uh, 1980s. So mid 80s was it? Yes, mid 80s. Okay. Uh, in Wichita on December 21st, 1984, near the end of 1984, and the, f the first woman found dead in Wichita Falls is 22-year-old Terry Sims. Uh, her friend Lisa Boond found her good friend Terry. What had happened? How did she die? Well, Terry was a student at Midwestern State University, and she worked at a local hospital. Um, she went to her house to study, and Lisa was going to come over later, later to help her study. Um, and so she had dropped her off, gone back to finish her shift at the hospital. Um, then all of a sudden there was a knock at the door, and Terry opened the door, and there was a, a man standing there drenched by the rain. Uh, before she could do anything, he burst through the door and began beating her. 
uh, even though Terry fought back, he was too strong for her. Um, he pulled her pink smock over her head, uh, tossed it on the coffee table, and then dragged her to the bedroom. Uh, he pulled a knife on Terry and began poking her with the tip of it. Uh, she even grabbed for the blade of the knife trying to defend herself um, and was severely cut. In fact, one finger was severed. Um, he grabbed an extension cord that was laying between the wall and the bed, uh, tied her up, and then he sexually uh, molested her or he raped her. Uh, he drug her to the bathroom and he slumped her body over the side of the bathtub and there he repeatedly stabbed her until she died. Okay, uh, now we're talking, you, you didn't describe um, Farian Wardrop. He's a huge man and we're talking these victims are about 100 pounds and 5 foot 2. So he's about 6 right. foot 6. He, he's about 6'6", six, six, um, thin, but still... Um, very overpowering to these women that were, uh, all of them were less than 5'6", most of them were 5'2 to 5'4". Right. Now, uh, now about a month later, 23-year-old nurse at Wichita Falls, Tony Gibbs, disappears. What were the circumstances surrounding her disappearance? Well, when Tony finished her shift, uh, she was leaving the Wichita Falls General Hospital when she saw Farron Waldrop, who was an orderly, a new orderly at the hospital, walking down the street. Uh, she stopped and she asked him if he'd like a ride. As soon as he got in the car, he demanded that she drive uh, to a construction site outside of town uh, on a desolate road. Uh, he began yelling at her, telling her he hated her, and he really didn't know Tony. He was just angry, uh, again, drug-induced and so forth. Uh, he said later that his anger was not directed at her, but directed uh, at his personal situation with his wife. Uh, Tony, like Terry Sims, was a fighter. Uh, she grabbed for the door handle just to get away, and she felt a sharp pain in her side, and that's when he had stabbed her. Um, he then, uh, she ran from the car and he caught her, dragged her through the underbrush to an abandoned, burned out school bus that was there uh, out in the country. Inside the uh, bus shell, he raped her uh, and then flipped her over and sodomized her. Uh, he took his knife and he stabbed her three times in the back and three times in the chest. Uh, he stepped her bloody clothes under the floorboard of the bus, and then he took off in Tony's white Camaro. Um, while he was fleeing the scene, Tony was not dead, and she was crawling, uh, trying to get out to a road, and she died about 100 yards from where the bus was. Well, now about a month later, Tony Gibbs' body is discovered. Uh, how was she discovered, and was there any useful evidence left at the crime scene? She was discovered by a Texas Electric serviceman who had gone out to inspect a transformer that was there in that area. Uh, he believed he saw something in the grass, and we, when he first looked at it, he thought it was a mannequin, and then he realized that it was a body, uh, and it was badly decomposing. Um, it was uh, She was laying face up. He called the police. When the police came out, they noticed that there were paw marks on her body. Uh, a portion of her left upper arm and her left calf had been eaten away by animals. Um, they found her clothing in the bus. They also found droplets of blood uh, in the bus, and they made impressions of tire marks outside of the bus. And all these were things that they used uh, in evidence later on. Uh, of course, the biggest thing was that because she had been raped, there was DNA left there. Oh, good. Okay, now, at this point, did police have any reason to link the two murders whatsoever? No, they really didn't. Uh, and, in fact, in order to ease the fears of the community in Wichita Falls, they insisted that there was no connection between the Sims murder and the Gibbs murders. Now, in this uh, interesting case, uh, there's a gentleman that comes into view here, uh, is uh, a gentleman named Danny Laughlin. And how did he become involved in this case? Well, Danny Laughlin was a local boy. He worked in a bar. Uh, he drove a motorcycle. And he was 
noticed driving up and down the site where Tony Gibbs' body had been eventually found. He also drew suspicion to himself because he had a pet wolf and he was walking the wolf out in that same area, again, where her body had been located. Um, They accused him of robbing a Southwestern Bell telephone office, but he told them that he could not have done it because he was in a field near U.S. Highway 281 at the time. Uh, that happened to be where the murder was located. So suddenly Danny Laughlin himself had put him at the top of their suspect list. Uh, he was arrested uh, and eventually tried for Gibbs' murder. Uh, there was a mistrial with a vote of 11 to 1 for uh, acquittal. Well, to be fair, he was also a prime suspect because he had information or he imparted information to people that had previously been only known to the killer, according to the police. Maybe That's tell us right. a little bit how he did eventually explain that, but it, you know that would be pretty good reason for police to suspect him. Oh yes, he he was bragging, particularly when he was in jail, and you know, he would brag that he knew about this and knew about that. He had just inserted himself into. Um, the investigation. Also, he had been brought in for questioning for the robbery, and while he was there, he learned some things from police talking and from papers that were laying around that gave him inside information on the case. And then, because Danny Laughlin liked attention and wanted to think that he had the inside track on things, he started telling people these incidents and these particulars of the case that only a killer would know. Uh, other than the police. So he was definitely his own worst enemy in this case, for sure. Definitely so. And the police basically thought they really had their man and they were they were focused on him and, and that's it. That's okay. right. Uh, it, that's, that's exactly right. In the Gibbs case, they were convinced that Don, uh, Danny Laughlin was the murderer and uh, continued to think that for a long time. Right. Now, shortly after, afterwards, after this incident, Ferrian moves from Wichita. Where does he go and why? Well, he moved to Fort Worth, and he went on the pretense of looking for employment. I think it was just getting a little hot in Wichita Falls, and, and he decided that he'd better take off for a while. But he sure. said that he had gone to look for employment. Now, a little while later, on March 24th, Deborah and Ken Taylor who live in Fort Worth, Texas, are having a get-together with friends and family at their home, and Deborah disappears. Now tell us about this party, what was reported to police, and what was their reaction, and did police believe that they had a good suspect, uh, and, and if so, who was their prime suspect? Uh, they did believe they had a suspect, and uh, they thought they had a very good suspect. Deborah and Ken were having a party in their backyard with friends and family, and Deborah decided that she wanted to go to the local club. And Ken said, no, no, we're just going to stay here. And, and um, so Deborah decided that she was going to go up to bed. Well, she goes up and slips out the front door. Um, and goes down to the club alone. When Kim went to bed, he didn't know where Deborah had gone, uh, and he didn't realize until the next morning that she had never come home that night. Um, so by that evening, which was a Monday evening by that time, he decided that he better call police because he had called family and friends that had been at the party and, and asked if they knew where she was, and, and no one did. They thought that she had just gone to bed. Um it was very unusual for her to be out that late at night. She hadn't even taken her purse. Um, but after her body was found, uh, Ken had made a statement to the press that it was an animal loose somewhere in Fort Worth and that he had to be found and stopped because uh, he didn't want this to happen to anyone else. Well, the police didn't believe Ken. They thought that they were not looking for a stranger, that Ken's story did not add up, and they thoroughly believed that Ken Taylor had murdered his wife. Now, how how long after the her disappearance was was the body found, and where was she found, or how was she found, and when? Um, it was found a, a while later. Um, I don't know exactly how long, but it was decomposed, and uh, she, 
she was just randomly found, and he went down to uh, identify the body, but he couldn't. It was so badly decomposed. She did have on a necklace that he had given her, so he was certain that that was Deborah. But they really didn't identify her except through dental records. So the police continued in the next uh, months and, and, and beyond to suspect Ken Taylor and focus their, their investigation on him and go eventually even try to file charges against Ken Taylor? Is that what happens? Uh, yes, ab- absolutely. For years they suspected Ken Taylor. Uh, in fact, they always did uh, and until the events that happened later in Wichita Falls. But um, they were convinced that it was Ken and even some of his family members began to suspect that, well, maybe it was him. The police were so adamant. Um, so he was pretty uh, pretty well run through it with the police department and constant questioning and so forth. Uh, just another casualty out of this. Uh, yes, he story. was. Now, there's another woman, another victim, Ellen Blau, who goes missing. Who is she? Uh, three weeks later, she is found. Did police have any evidence linking these murders at this time? Uh, no, they still didn't. Of course, Wichita Falls didn't know about Deborah Taylor in Fort Worth. They right. had no idea that um, Farron Waldrop knew all of these women. Um, Ellen Blaw was also a student at Midwestern State University. Uh, she often visited friends um, in the same apartment building that Farron Waldrop lived in. Uh, she also worked at a shop that was just down the street from where Farron Waldrop worked. Um, so that was a yet another law enforcement agency. So we had three law enforcement agencies all working individual cases, uh, no one sharing information with each other. Uh, so they really weren't working together and had no idea that they were connected in any way. And, and also evidence of that as well is uh, our next, my next question is uh, a gentleman named Larry Granger is a, important person in this story as well. Who is Larry Granger and how is he involved with this case? Larry Granger was really a very important player in this. Uh, He was a friend of Waldrop's. Uh, He phoned the Wichita Falls Police and told them that Waldrop had a connection to the four women in Wichita Falls who had been killed. Um, He also informed them that uh, that Waldrop had a double-edged knife that he always carried with him. And Granger's statements were put in a central file, but they were never made part of any unsolved murder. Uh, so it, his information really just kind of slipped through the cracks. Uh, and he only told one agency versus the three agencies that were working these cases. Now, yeah. Farian and his wife, uh, I'm going a little bit backwards here in time, and, and you can, you, you can uh, qualify this whole thing here. What happens with Farron and his wife and her family? And then tell us about the move to Galveston, Texas. Okay. Um, Jonna and Farron were always having problems, and particularly money problems because he couldn't keep a job and she didn't work. Uh, Her parents had even loaned them $5,000 at one time because they were broke. Jonna's father became very angry when he found out that Farron had spent all of the money on dope. So he decided at that point that he was going to meet Jonna and the two children in with he and Jonna's mother. Uh, but he refused to let Farron move in with them. Um, when John Jackson and his wife were helping Jonna move, Farron arrived. Uh, he became very angry that they were taking his family, and he grabbed the baby. And in a fit, he threw the baby up in the air, and Jonna's mother caught the child before she was able to fall to the ground uh, and clung to her to protect her. Farron became even more enraged, and he ran upstairs um, and uh, to get a knife. Well, first, before he did that, Uh, he told uh, his father-in-law that he had always wanted to get a piece of him. And he went to strike John Jackson, but he hit Farron squarely in the face before that could happen. 
Uh, Farron then ran upstairs. He returned with a butcher knife in his hand, just as the Jacksons and his family were pulling away in the car. Farron showed up a short time later at the Jacksons' home, um, but he was met at the front door with uh, John Jackson holding a three fifty eight in his hand and sirens blaring in the background. They had called the police because he was there. Uh, he fled the scene. Um, a short time later is when he met uh, Tina Kimbrew, who was uh, one of his victims as well. Uh, Farron was depressed. He was guilt-ridden after uh, he had taken the life of Tina Kimbrew, and he drove 400 miles south to Galveston, Texas. It's on the Gulf. Um, he decided, uh, sitting in uh, his motel room, that he needed to call 911. Uh, he told the operator he was going to kill himself. When the police arrived uh, in response to that, he told them that he had killed a Tina Kimbrew in Wichita Falls. Okay, now he, he had confessed to Tina Kimbrew's murder, and then right. he pled guilty in court. Well, I won't. I don't want to rush the, the turn of events here. Tell us a little bit about that. Tina, he, he confesses to the murder. What does he specifically confess to other than saying that he has killed her. Does he give any details? Does he give any motive for why he's done this? Tell us a little bit about that. No, he really doesn't. He said that Tina was his friend. He didn't mean to do it. Um, you know, he was using drugs and alcohol. He had all of his excuses. Um, the interesting part of the story is that as he was confessing to Tina's murder, he never mentioned any other women that he had assaulted or killed. Um, so he only stuck to the Tina story, and he stuck to his contention that it was an accident and that he was under the influence of drugs and alcohol at the time. Oh, excuse me. Now, uh, Farron Wardrip receives a 35-year sentence for the murder. How does he then proceed with his new life in prison what what is his demeanor what does he do does he does he start working towards getting out what is it? he has an attitudinal change what happens in prison in prison he um was pretty much a model prisoner he uh began studying the bible as so many of them do uh he began writing for the newspaper uh at the prison there um and he was pretty well keeping his nose clean uh, and just going along and doing what he was supposed to do. Uh, four years after receiving the sentence, uh, he was up for parole yet a second time, which uh, Robert Kimbrew, which was Tina's dad, just couldn't believe it. He was furious because this man had been up for parole not once but twice. So he gathered more than 2,000 letters protesting the release of uh, the convicted killer. Uh, he fought really hard to keep Waldrop in prison, and his uh, efforts paid off. He um, stayed in prison for 11 years. Now, in prison, Robert Kimbrew had the opportunity to face the killer and ask him some questions that, that were nagging on his mind. And Waldrop had agreed that he wanted to say some things to the victim's father. What transpired at that meeting? That was set up by the victim services uh, with the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, the prison system here. Um, they agreed to meet. Uh, they met for four and a half hours, and there's always uh, a mediator that is there to make sure that things go well. Uh, Waldrop lied to Kimbrough, uh, which is not surprising. Uh, he said that uh, he was a straight-A student and very popular in school, which we knew was a lie. Uh, Robert Kimber didn't know at the time. Then he got into trouble with drugs and alcohol, and he admitted that to uh, Mr. Kimber. He also lied um, about his father. He said that he was extremely ill and that he wanted to get out of prison to be able to see him and to spend time with him. Right. He also said that Tina was the only person he ever hurt, that he had never hurt anyone else in his life. Um, Waldrop said that he was truly sorry for Tina's death. And evidently, it somewhat touched Kimbrew. Um, he hoped that, he told Waldrop that he hoped that he 
saw Tina's face every day of his life, not as a punishment, but as a reminder to stay clean and stay sober and that this would never happen again to anyone else. He also told Waldrop that if he ever felt out of control again, that to call him or to call someone else and reach out for help. Um, And at the end of the visit, uh, Robert Kimbrew extended his hand to Farron Waldrop, and they shook hands. That's uh, that's fascinating, incredible. The psychopathic uh, killer, in the mind. Why did he did he give an explanation why he killed his daughter, though? Not really. Uh, I mean, other than it was an accident. Um, that's all he ever said. He he never really gave a reason. He blamed it primarily on the drugs itself? On behavior. the drugs, and that he was angry at his wife. Whenever he saw a victim's face, he was seeing Jonna's face, and that he was carrying out these acts to punish Jonna, not the women. Now, you haven't mentioned it, uh, because I know that religion, or the, uh, or the, at least the pretense of Wardrop finding religion in prison, at this time when he meets Robert Kimbrew, is he again a born-again Christian, or is he a very devout religious person in prison, and do you think that might have affected Robert Kimbrew in in his act of forgiveness of him? I it could have in some way. Uh, Farron does contend that uh, he found Christ in prison, that he studied the Bible there, and that he was a changed person because of that. Um, in the five and a half hours that they spoke, I'm sure that there were times when he told Robert Kibber those things. He also said that God had forgiven him um, and that, you know, he accepted what had happened as far as his sentence and so forth uh, as punishment. Very interesting. Now, after 11 years, Wardrop is released. How did he conduct himself once he was released from prison? What did he do? Well, he went to Olney, Texas, which is uh, only a few miles from uh, Wichita Falls, about 30, 45 miles, and uh, that's where his parents lived. Uh, His father went to their church that they belonged to, and he told the congregation that his son was getting out of prison and that he asked for their forgiveness for him, that he asked that they love him and accept him into the church um, and to support him. Farron was wearing an electronic leg monitor uh, as part of his parole requirements, and that restricted his movement, so he really never went outside of Olney. Uh, He was afraid that the people wouldn't accept him, and he had to make up some reason why he had this leg monitor on other than he had maliciously killed Tina Kimbrew. So he told them that he had committed vehicular manslaughter. He thought that was a lesser charge and that that would um, suffice since he told them that he had had an alcohol problem and he was overcoming that. He became very involved in that church, uh, and he asked to be a part of the Wednesday night services, uh, and he even was asked to give his testimony to the youth of the church. Then friends introduced him to Glenda Glenda Kelly. Uh, She was five years older than Farron, and they dated a while, but not very long, and they were married. Um, And even though Farron's brother Bryce encouraged him to tell Glenda the truth of what had happened to Tina Kimbrew, he said no, that he couldn't do that, um, that he couldn't tell her the truth. Um, And he wouldn't tell her. He never did tell her. Uh, prior to his second arrest, uh, he went to work at the Olney Door and Screen Company. Uh, he was a very well liked employee and he was a hard worker. Uh, I spoke to his boss there and they thought very highly of him. Right. So he, he marries Glenna Kelly. Uh, what's their life like uh, other than he's, he's now preaching in the, or doing Sunday school? Uh, instruction and preaching in the church. He's turned his life around. He has a secret uh, from the entire community, really, uh, his father's support. How many more years of, of what's happened in the next few years and then suddenly the the bottom falls out of Farian Wardrop's life? Well, while he was living in Olney, 
um, the prosecutors for both Wichita County and uh, Clay County had their investigators looking over the unsolved murders. Um, and so they were going through all of the files, uh, checking to see if there was anything uh, that connected them at all uh, or anything that they could find. They found that the DNA connected them, that both women um, had been sexually assaulted and they had DNA frozen, DNA samples from those cases. Um, then they found a note in one of the files, and that note was, uh, in regard to Thomas uh, Granger's um, report to the police um, that twice he had called them and said that he suspected Farron Waldrop of the murders. Uh, in fact, the second time, Granger had even worked with a private investigator to link Waldrop to the women, uh, but no one had ever acted on that. So uh, investigator um, Little and... Oh, Paul Smith, they um, they found this information to be very interesting, and they decided that they wanted to look at uh, Waldrop just a little bit more. Okay, now, before we get into what happens next, what, meanwhile, back back in the, in the halls of justice, what's happened with uh, Ken Taylor, and what's happened with the the biker? I just can't remember his name right there. The Danny Laughlin. Uh, exactly. Danny Laughlin. Uh, they never retried a second time. Um, he moved to Colorado because he felt very persecuted in Wichita County, which I'm sure he was. People looked at him as a murderer. Uh, and while he was in Colorado, he was killed in an accident. And so he, his name was never exonerated until after um, he was gone, after it was too late. Uh, Ken Taylor lost everything. He lost his family. He lost his business. He lost everything because of what he considered the persecution of law enforcement in Fort Worth because they continued um, for 15 years to uh, every once in a while come back to him and ask him questions and, and interrogate him uh, about the death of his wife. That's incredible. And and, and the thing was with uh, Danny Laughlin, he was very fortunate not to be convicted at that first trial. He, he really jury. was. And I think that primarily the reason that he wasn't was because the district attorney brought in three jailhouse snitches, as they call them, and they testified against him. And uh, they weren't credible at all. And the jury just didn't buy their stories. Right. Yeah, incredible. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure people knew, because that's an incredibly interesting and unique aspect of a story, all, all that devastation with the police. So, I mean, it's always hindsight is is much better than uh, in in retrospect, but still, the, the the police really did drop the ball in that case. Now, now Farian is in linked. They say you have a DNA link between the two Sims and uh, Gibbs. And mm -hmm. Gibbs. And so now, what happens next as a result? Well, Farron was on their radar, and they decided that they needed a sample from him to determine if it matched the samples from Sims and Gibbs. Well, John Little, uh, the DA's investigator from Wichita County, drove up to Olney and to the Olney Door and Screen Company. Uh, he sat in his car, and he watched Waldrop. And Waldrop was in a car with his wife visiting on his break, uh, he was drinking up a cup of coffee from a paper cup, and he was drink eating some cheese crackers. When he exited that car, he threw them into a trash barrel, threw the cup into the trash barrel. John Little uh, went across the street from where he had been watching Waldrop, and he picked up the cup out of the trash. In fact, Waldrop asked him what he wanted, uh, if he could help him. And he said, well, I need a dip cup. In Texas, at least, uh, a lot of people chew tobacco, men chew tobacco, and uh, they spit into a cup. And so um, Farron said, sure, take what you need. Well, uh, John Little noticed the cup with crackers, cheese crackers on the rim, and he knew that was the one that Farron had just disposed of. So he took it. Farron told him he could have it. Um, therefore, it became evidence. 
and he took it back. They sent it to the lab to be tested um, to see if the DNA matched. And what was the result? It did. Uh, the company, uh, Gene Screen, called um, the DA's office and gave them the results, and they were just ecstatic. They said, we've got him. You know, after all these years, we have the connection. And so he was arrested. Um, he, in fact, he was interesting enough. He was arrested at his patro- his parole officer's office the day that he was to have the electronic monitor removed from his leg. Once that had been removed, he would have been able to travel anywhere he wanted to, uh, a greater distance away from Alney, back into Wichita Falls, back into Fort Worth, um, wherever he had wanted to. Oh. Now, Farron did not tell authorities the truth when questioned, and then he asked to speak to them. He wanted to talk. Uh, I guess he had gone back to his cell, and then he decided he wanted to talk. What did he finally tell police in February 1999 about other murders, and why do you think he confessed? What compelled him to do that? Well, he says he had talked with his wife that morning after his arrest, and that they had prayed about it and talked about it, and that... um, he decided he needed to tell everything. So he sent word to John Little uh, that he wanted to share some more information with them. When they took him into the interview room, uh, John Little turned on a tape recorder, and Farron began to tell them in detail uh, the murders of Sims, Gibbs, and Blau, uh, and where he had done it, uh, how he had done it, and so forth. Uh, just as Little was going to turn the recorder off, Farron said, oh, wait, my conscience has, uh, has to keep me going. Uh, there's one more, but it's not in Wichita Falls. And that's when he told them about Deborah Taylor. Farron Waldrop would never have been connected with the Deborah Taylor case had he not told the Wichita Falls authorities because there was no DNA evidence in that case. Now, did he give? What was his reason for the murders? What did he say was the reason for those? I know you said that he was mad at his his wife. Uh, uh, did he stick with that story? Is that what he That's said? That's exactly his what he stuck with. Yes, that every woman, when he looked in their face, he was looking at Johnna's face. He blamed it on drug and alcohol abuse. Uh, of course, he blamed it on everything, but his uh, inability to control his actions. Um, he confessed. Um, I believe because there was no way out. They they knew he knew they had him. Uh, why he confessed to Deborah Taylor, I don't know. And unless at that point he just thought, well, four, what's five? Um, he did profess to believe in God. Said he believed in God's uh, forgiveness and that he may have thought in his own mind that if he said told everybody everything that he might get leniency. Uh, Who really knows what goes through these guys' minds? Right. Now, you have a death penalty in Texas, and so obviously it becomes a death penalty case, um, if I'm not correct. The other thing is... the, The other thing is is that what is his psychological state, and does that ever become a defense issue, or is there any talk of that? How does that work? Did any psychologists see him and examine him? Um, they did, but um, there, there was nothing there that they could use for uh, a defense. In Texas, uh, insanity defense is next to impossible to prove uh, and to get um, – not guilty by reason of insanity um, because it becomes a legal definition, not a medical definition. Um, And he was not legally insane. Uh, He he has some quirks. (laughs) Uh, He is OCD, uh, obsessive compulsive uh, about the way he dresses, the way everything has to be on a table in front of him. Um, He's quirky, but he's not insane. And that could not be used in a defense for him. Now, uh, was because the death penalty was there, was there some sort of plea bargain, or was there a full a formal trial? What, what happened? Well, actually, uh, it was. I was at the trial, and it was a very, it was a big surprise to everyone in attendance because when they started the trial, um, the 
prosecutor said he was ready and the defense said they were ready and then the defense said, Your Honor, we would like to plead guilty. Well, Barry Mock of the district attorney was ready to go with a full-fledged uh, guilt-innocence phase of the trial. Well, at that point, uh, because he had pled guilty, they went straight to the penalty phase. And Maka presented uh, all of his evidence that he had for the guilt-innocence phase into the punishment phase, which means that he could bring in all of the other victims. Maka had a large... Um, poster board with all the women's pictures on it that he kept facing the jury the entire trial and so those jury that jury could picture those women and they became human to them they became real people not just um photos um they they came alive to them and and that was pretty impressive um but they went straight to the punishment phase now, were the victims, any of the victims' families present at the trial? Yes, all of the victims' families. Even uh, Ken Taylor was present at the trial. Uh, the Kimbrews were uh, probably, well, they displayed the most anger of any. Uh, the Sims family, which is the one that he was actually convicted of, uh, he took... Uh, in plea bargains, life sentences for the others, but uh, he was found guilty and given the death penalty for Terry Sims' murder. The Sims were just relieved that it was over, that he had been found guilty, and uh, it was behind them. Uh, but the Kimbrews really held more hostility uh, than any of the others because um, I... I I don't know why, because he had served at least 11 years for the murder of their daughter. Um, but I guess because he had lied to Robert Kimbrough so much during that mediation time that oh, he sure. was very angry. Yeah, definitely used him. You say Ken Taylor was also present? Yes, he was there. Wow, what, and, was, uh, what was it like for him, and what was his reaction? It was very difficult. Um he cried. Uh, his daughter was there with him, which they had been estranged for years. Um, it was a relief to him for the world to know for certain that he had not committed murder of his wife. Um, and it was important for his daughters to know that. Um, but it was very, very difficult because, as he said to me, it doesn't change how bad his life had been for the last years because this man would not take responsibility. Well, and just his wife being murdered, just incredible how you, you know, most people will never recover from that alone, let alone being accused and having right. their family destroyed. Um, now, what was the end result? He, he, you say he, he did receive the death penalty? He did receive the death penalty for uh, the death of... Um, Terry Sims, and um, he received life sentences for Tony Gibbs, Ellen Blaw, and Deborah Taylor. Um, so he has been on death row since 1999 uh, in Texas, in Livingston, Texas. Has there any been any other developments in the case at all? The appeals uh, are, are been taken care Actually, of? Actually, uh, yes. In fact, last month, uh, in April of this year, a federal judge... Uh, said that he had to be granted a new punishment trial or agree to, or, or the district attorney had to agree to give him a life sentence. Why um, was that? They said that he had ineffective counsel, ineffective defense, that um, during the trial his public defender had not brought out the fact that while he was uh, incarcerated before that he had been a model prisoner, that he had written for the newspaper and done all these fine things in prison. Uh, because one of the things that they asked them during a punishment phase, they asked the jury, do you believe he would be um, a threat to society, even to prison society, uh, right. if he were allowed to live? And that was not brought out, and so they had given him the death penalty. So he is entitled to another punishment trial, or has is, is that already occurred? Yes. Or when? No. Uh, actually, I don't believe the district attorney has made the decision yet. Um, 
my feeling is that they'll retry it um, because my feeling is that they they wanted to die on the gurney um, rather than have the life sentences in Texas. I see a life sentence today is um, forty years minimum. It's not right. a life sentence, uh, but in 1985, it was like 15 years. So, uh, I mean, he could get out virtually. Now, I don't think the Pardon and Paroles Board would allow that, but you never know with overcrowding of prison, prisons and so forth. So my guess is that, and the same district attorney is still there in Wichita County, my guess is that they'll retry it. Well, wouldn't they have consecutive sentences? You say he had three other life sentences, and if even if he had four life sentences, wouldn't that just amount to, you know, 120 years? So. Well, I don't know. I don't know how they did them. Uh, whether they stacked them or they're consecutive or they're concurrent, I right. I don't know. And in, in the uh, information that I have available, I I really don't know that. Normally, a lot of times when they do that, they stack them versus making them consecutive. I, I see. Making them concurrent then. So, concurrent, I mean, yes. Yes. Oh, that's problematic for sure. Yeah. Yes. And, and, <laughs> and, also, that's a very interesting, very interesting. Now, um, so basically, what was your experience like having gone through all of this? How much of an ordeal was it for you? or what? Tell us about your overall experience about researching and writing this book. Well, actually... Uh, it was easier than some in that um, they had been gra- the defense had been granted a change of venue actually to the county that I live in, uh, Wichita Falls and Wichita County is a couple of counties over from me. So versus going up and having to stay uh, in a hotel and go to trial every day, um, I got to go home every night, <laughs> and uh, so that was very nice. Also. Uh, it's always nice for a writer to be able to attend a trial because you get to speak with everyone. Uh, sure. You get to uh, interact with them uh, at recesses and so forth. So um, it, it was an experience that was a little bit more, um, it was a little easier as far as the research goes, but then there were so many to research that made it a little difficult as well. So it was kind of a catch-22. What was Farian Wardrop's demeanor at the trial? What was he like? He was um, fairly arrogant. Uh, He was very upset with his defense attorney and showed it. Uh, He would lean over and ask him to ask certain questions, and his attorney would shake his head, and he would become angry. Uh, I spoke with the investigator for the public defender's office, and she he drove her crazy because he had to have a certain pair of socks and a certain belt for court each day because he has this OCD thing going. And, right. uh, but he, I mean, he was quiet, but um, also it's very interesting because uh, the second chair of the public defender's office was a female, and she was the one that sat next to him, and occasionally she would put her arm around him, and I asked Dory about that, and, and she said, well, I was trying to show the jury that, you know, I'm a woman and I'm not afraid of him. And uh, so there are always those little ploys and those little tricks they use, just like Dory told me that before she left the motel room, uh, for the first day of trial, she grabbed the motel Bible out of the drawer and had him carry it with him each day, uh, right. just as a prop. Well, so you get lawyer... all those those little um, colorful uh, displays that you don't catch if you're not in trial. Well, I mean, at that point, they are right fighting for his life. Did you really think? Oh, did absolutely. You, did you uh, think though and... he had? Did you think he had ineffective counsel, especially in fa- in the in in the <coughs> pardon me, sorry. Given the fact that they didn't uh, offer much of a defense when they were at trial, do you think there was any grounds to the charge that he had ineffective counsel? Yes, personally, I do. Um, John Curry, which was first chair for public defender, he he never asked questions. Uh, I'm not sure he ever asked a question. If he did, he didn't ask over two questions of all the witnesses that were presented by the state. Uh, 
in his closing arguments, they get like 45 minutes. He took five minutes and wow. he cried in front of the um, the jury. And really? all he could say is, this man has changed. He's found God and, and he deserves to live. And, and he had tears. And to me, that is not an effective defense. I uh, know. That's, I think maybe you should get that from the client or from the defendant itself. If he might right. shed some tears and show some remorse, that might have worked. Um, this is an incredible book. Uh, it's called Body Hunter, if people have been listening for the, the last hour. Uh, Patricia Springer. Now, Pat, what's been going on? Uh, tell us a little bit more about some of your other work, and tell us especially about the latest project that you have. We've got about three minutes now. Okay, the latest project, uh, in fact, it's just released this week. Uh, The name of this book uh, is Lethal Charmer. It's a story out of Fort Worth, Texas. Um, Stephen Barbie um, was recently married. He had been married for two months, and he had a pregnant girlfriend that his wife didn't know about, and he killed her so that she wouldn't tell his wife about the baby. While he was killing Lisa Underwood, her seven-year-old son came into the room, uh, could identify him, so he also killed the the child. Uh, Lisa was eight months pregnant, uh, so in essence, three people died that day. Um, And in Texas, just killing a pregnant woman and her fetus would be capital murder. Uh, But They didn't take that direction. It is capital murder because of two people. But um, he, they didn't go to the to the defense of, I mean, to the prosecution of the baby uh, being killed. Uh, Stephen Barbie dumped her body in an adjacent county, and um, then he confessed. Then he recanted. Um, But the the really tragic part of all of this is that. Uh, I've become very close with Lisa Underwood's mother, uh, and that was her entire family. She had one child and one grandchild and one grandchild on the way, and so she was left with nothing. Uh, Jackie Barbie, Stephen's mother, had lost two children already. Her daughter w- uh, became ill and died. Uh, her other son was killed in a one-car car accident, and now her only child is on death row. So these are two mothers that have lost virtually everything. Sure. Yeah, there's no happy endings in true crime, usually. No, there's not. Uh, no, not very much. Even if brought to justice, that's a little, little comfort, and there really is no closure. So, um, You were also an author of a few more books. Tell us uh, about the titles of some of the other books and uh, give us some little okay. bit. Okay. And Never See Her Again uh, is the story of a kidnapping of a six-year-old child, um, the massive manhunt for her, and the prosecution of of her kidnapper. um, Because he was a registered sex offender, it was an automatic life sentence when he was convicted. Uh, It took two trials. The first trial was a hung jury, um, but the prosecutor persisted and got a conviction on the second trial, and five years after she was kidnapped, her body was found. Um, And then I have a book uh, called Murder So Cold that takes place in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and that was a man who murdered his wife, um, stuck her in a barrel, and put the barrel in Lake Erie. They have never located uh, Chris Russell's uh, body. Bloodstains is another Texas murder. Um, Most of my books uh, occur in Texas. The stories are are from Texas, although there is one um, in Tennessee. It's of Krista Pike, a love to die for, and for many, many years she was the youngest woman on death row in the United States. She killed at 18. Incredible, incredible. Well, I want to thank you very much, uh, Patricia Springer, for a very, very informative program and, and a great book. And thank you for discussing Body Hunter on my program, True Murder, here. It's been a, a pleasure. Thank you, Dan. I want to thank you and have a great evening. You too. Good night. Good night. Good night. You've been listening to the program True Murder with your host, Dan Zapansky. I'll see you next time. Good night. <laughs>